Hello and welcome, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Suyong Kim, and I co-head the Antitrust and Competition and Economic Regulation uh, Group here at Hogan Lovells. I want to welcome you today uh, to our webcast on the latest developments in US and EU cartel damages claims. Today is the fifth and final pro uh, program of our 2013 series of webcasts, which we have called the Global Antitrust Corner. Our aim in this series has been to bridge our antitrust lawyers from around the world and to assemble them for you to discuss the leading topics that are relevant to you and your practice. During the 60 minutes uh, webcast today, we will address issues impacting businesses that are either facing or seeking to bring potential antitrust damages claims in the United States and Europe, particularly focusing on the United Kingdom and Germany in Europe, which are major jurisdictions for cartel damages claims. I'd like to introduce today's speakers, all of whom are members of the Hogan Lovells Antitrust Competition and Economic Regulation Practice. In Washington, D.C. today, we have Ben Holt. We have Chris Hutton here beside me in London. And in Munich, we have Christoph Wunschmann. I need to start with a couple of points of um, housekeeping to start with. This webcast will take a total of 60 minutes We'll speak for approximately 50 minutes and leave 10 minutes for question and answers. If at any time you do have questions, please type them in the Q&A box on your screen. If we do not have time to answer them to, during today's uh, webcast, we will contact you after the webcast to answer your questions. This webcast is also eligible for CLE and CBD credits. We will announce the codes at the end of the presentation. Please remember to complete the necessary forms or survey, depending on which type of credit you are applying for, when the program concludes. The CLE forms can be found in the resource list link box at the bottom of your screen, and the CPD survey link is located on the left-hand side of the screen under Media Player. I now turn to Ben in Washington to begin today's discussion by setting out why the issue of antitrust damages is so important. Thank you, Ben. Thanks, Sue Young. Uh, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, depending on your location. So uh, we're here to talk about follow-on litigation to cartel investigations. And cartel investigations get a lot of press, and rightly so. There's there are potentially jail time involved in the U.S. There are huge fines, um, significant reputational damages involved. Uh, but we want to give an example of why it's important to also think about follow-on litigation early and often uh, and to coordinate across jurisdictions. So on the slide, we have an example here of Dow Chemical. And this, uh, as you'll see, there's a jury verdict against Dow in February of this year, and it got a lot of press. Um, Dow was held to have violated the Sherman Act and found liable for, uh, for $400 million in actual damages to the plaintiffs. Under U.S. law, this is automatically trebled to $1.2 billion. Now, the court did reduce it a bit to $1.06 billion to account for settlements that the plaintiffs had already achieved. And so, as I said, this got a lot of press because it was such a huge verdict. But what I found most interesting when I looked into the history of this case was that a few years earlier in 2007, Dow had announced that the DOJ had closed its investigation with respect to Dow uh, and had not fined Dow. There had been some fines issued to other companies, um, but Dow did not receive a fine. And so nonetheless, despite not receiving a fine from the Department of Justice, Dow ended up with an enormous judgment of over a billion dollars. It is on appeal at the moment, so it's possible that that will uh, change or be reduced. But I think this illustrates why follow-on litigation is critical to think about early on. And this isn't to second-guess any decisions that Dow made, but simply to underscore that companies have to consider this early on if they're subject to investigations. And it's not just U.S. follow-on litigation that companies have to consider. Many other jurisdictions have become venues for damages claims as well. And so antitrust litigation often ends up being multi-jurisdictional. And this sort of stems from the fact that cartels that underlie a lot of this litigation uh, often involve events that span a wide geographical scope. Many times there's conduct that occurs in different or alleged to have occurred in different jurisdictions. 
And even if not, uh, there often is an impact on different jurisdictions. And so as a result, you have claimants and defendants from multiple countries. You have losses suffered in multiple countries. Sometimes there's overlap there perfectly, sometimes not. Uh, and you have different uh, countries and different jurisdictions whose laws are a bit different and who approach, uh, who approach these types of cases with different enforcement, different laws. And so you end up with individual lawsuits uh, that often span multiple countries, or perhaps in addition to that, you have multiple lawsuits in different countries going on at the same time. And I'm going to now turn it over to Chris in London, who I think is going to take us through an example of this. Thanks, Ben. In fact, a, a very, very good illustration of the multi-jurisdictional nature and scope of antitrust damages claims, and of the scale of the challenges involved for all parties, um, is provided by the real-life example of the alleged air cargo cartel. As you can see from the slide, uh, the air cargo cartel involved an alleged worldwide um, cartel in relation to surcharges imposed on cargo shipments. As a result, this case gave rise to truly global legal and practical issues and challenges for all parties involved. Unsurprisingly, when the alleged cartel came to light, it attracted significant publicity and prompted a raft of regulatory investigations across the globe. As you can see from the slide, um, regulatory investigations were launched in the US, Canada, and Europe, and a number of other countries. Um, and dealing with investigations in such a large number of jurisdictions gave rise to a host of practical and legal issues. But those difficulties were nothing um, compared to the complexity of dealing with damages claims in multi multiple jurisdictions. And again, somewhat unsurprisingly, private claims arising out of the alleged air cargo cartel have been launched in jurisdictions across the globe, um, with private claims being launched in the US, Canada, and the UK. And claims brought in the UK in particular um, allege competitional violations involving routes across the globe. And as, as Ben says, this very neatly illustrates the point that numerous local and international legal issues can arise as a result of the geographic scope of um, many alleged cartels. And unfortunately, as Christoph will now um, explain in more detail, there's a lack of uniformity across the globe as to the relevant procedural and legal issues. And navigating those issues poses significant challenges for potential claimants and defendants. Yes, uh, another good morning and good afternoon from Munich. Um, the key takeaway from, from the world map, which, which Chris just showed us, is that when it comes to uh, international cartels, um, the, the possible victims typically have the choice between many different jurisdictions where they can claim uh, for follow-on damages. And the reason for this is uh, because the uh, rules on international jurisdictions uh, are, generally speaking, fairly broad based on the domicile of the cartelists or the effects uh, on the market of the uh, cartel agreement. So if you take an example of, let's say, a cartel with um, different uh, cartelists uh, located in different uh, countries, um, and let's take a um, price-fixing cartel um, on an international level or even worldwide scope, um, then the uh, claimants uh, typically have the choice and can shop around and can choose as a jurisdiction which they think is, is best suited for for their case. And when making uh, this uh, choice, um, they consider many different factors. And today we have chosen, which we think are three, let's say, um, central topics uh, for this uh, forum shopping decision, so to say. Uh, the first one is uh, the question if um, collective actions are possible. The second one uh, being uh, what are the rules on pretrial uh, discovery and disclosure. And the third one is um, how are damages calculated. However, there are, uh, and this is really important to emphasize, many other factors to consider. Uh, both relating to the applicable substantive law, the sub applicable procedural law, but also to, so to say, non-legal issues. We have uh, on this slide uh, listed a few uh, elements here. Uh, just briefly, uh, obviously limitation periods can vary substantially. This is uh, clearly a hard factor to consider. Um, then the question whether and the extent to which uh, cartel authorities' decision have a binding effect for the civil courts is another one. 
the standard of proof as well as the allocation of proof is, is important. So, for example, you might have a rebuttable presumption that a cartel typically leads to, to a damage or even a certain overcharge. Um, other factors which we listed here are, are costs, uh, speed, efficiency of litigation, but also uh, experience of the judges and the courts generally, and others like, for example, just a practical one, translations, because these cases are, are heavily paper-driven, and if you need to translate all your document, this could also be a decisive factor. So just, this should just give you an idea of the variety of, of uh, factors, and with this I hand uh, back to Ben in Washington. Thanks, Christoph. So our first topic, as Christoph mentioned, is collective redress. And uh, as many of you probably know, collective redress or class actions are well established in the U.S. We've had nearly 50 years of class actions. Uh, and cases in the U.S. are opt-out cases, meaning that once a court decides that certification of the class is appropriate, then the class members, the, the members of that class, are bound by a settlement or a judgment uh, in the case. Um, and the important thing, there are many things you could say about class certification and class actions in the U.S., but a really critical thing is that the class certification decision is really a crucial point for most cases and, and probably becoming more so. Um, the, I put on the slide, I won't walk through them, but the standards for class certification in the U.S., um, these arise under Federal Rule of Civil Procedure 23. Um, but when a class is certified, uh, the case... Cases rarely are tried after that point, although the Dow example we, we looked at earlier is, is, uh, is an exception, and it does happen sometimes. But that shows you uh, in some ways why these classes are and cases are often not tried, because the damage potential is so large. And so there's a lot of pressure on defendants to simply settle at some point before trial, uh, regardless of what they think of the merits of the claim. Conversely, on the plaintiff side, class actions in the U.S. are driven by plaintiff's lawyers for the most part. Um, they often take the cases on a contingency fee basis. And so if a class is not certified, then in some respects there is pressure on the plaintiff's attorneys to at least change their strategy, if not settle the case on behalf of the individual plaintiffs. Um, and so uh, most of the action in antitrust cases, just looking at these factors, is around the predominance prong, which is second from the bottom in the list. And that asks the question of whether common questions of law and fact predominate over individual ones. And if they do, then the plaintiffs have met that prong. And if they have met the others as well, class certification is appropriate. Um, if they don't, uh, then the class may not be certified. And so in antitrust cases, the question is generally whether the impact of the alleged violation and any damages that might have resulted can be proven on a class-wide basis. And this usually involves testimony from economists uh, and becomes a battle of the experts in some respect. And the trend in the U.S., there have been several recent Supreme Court cases um, that appear, at least on their face, to require a more stringent analysis, particularly of the predominance prong, and perhaps an inquiry into the underlying merits of the claim not just the class aspect. Now, it remains to be seen, though, uh, how that will actually affect cases. It has started to play out in some lower courts over the past year or so, and some of the lower courts have interpreted the Supreme Court language to really require a more rigorous analysis and require them to really dig in deeply to expert reports, think about whether evidence is admissible, other courts have said that it, it really reflects current practice and doesn't change that much. And so this will be a, a development that will be worth watching as we go along. Um, and at a minimum, it really does make the class certification decision even more important, particularly for large antitrust cases. And now I'm going to turn it over to Chris in the UK to give us the view from London. And thanks, Ben. Well, the position in relation to uh, collective redress in the UK is not nearly as well advanced um, as it is in the States, but proposed reforms in the UK will lead to a significant change in the landscape um, for collective redress. The, the current position is that opt-out class actions um, are not available in the UK. However, there are mechanisms in place um, to allow opt-in type collective redress. So, for example, follow-on 
claims can be brought in the UK Competition Appeal Tribunal by specified bodies on behalf of consumers. This is effectively an opt-in mechanism, and the consumer claims must all relate to the same infringement of competition law. However, this does not have a great track record, and in fact, there's only been one case um, brought under this mechanism over the past 10 years. There are also means by which um, opt-in claims can be pursued in the High Court. Um, these are representative proceedings and joint litigation orders, um, also group litigation orders. However, um, again, only one of these cases has been brought, and that not successfully. So there's not a great track record for collective redress in the antitrust um, sphere in the UK. However, um, as set out on the slide, some significant reforms um, are due to be introduced into the UK, which will fun fundamentally alter, alter the landscape. <clears throat> um, so the Competition Appeal Tribunal um, will now have powers to hear collective actions, and that is both opt-in and opt-out collective actions. These claims can be brought by claimants themselves or by representative bodies such as consumer associations. But law firms, third-party funders, and special purpose vehicles will not be able to bring these claims or will not be able to bring opt-out claims. Um, the Competition Appeal Tribunal will also have a key role in the way that these cases are run, and so will, for example, certify whether collective action is appropriate in any particular case, and also whether the case should proceed as either an opt-in or an opt-out um, case. I should clarify, that, though, that the opt-out part of any representative action will only apply to UK domiciled claimants. Claimants that are outside the UK will, however, be able to opt in to such claims. And that's, that's a very key issue um, because in the UK, lots of European cases are brought which involve claimants and, and cartels that stretch across the whole of Europe. Um, a number of safeguards will be put in place, although the details aren't yet known, um, in order to avoid unnecessary and burdensome litigation. So in particular, um, claimants will not be able to recover treble or exemplary damages um, the starting point for any costs management um, is to be the loser pays principle. Um, contingency fees or damages based agreements will not be permitted, although it's worth noting that no win, no fee conditional fee arrangements and after the event insurance will be available. Um, and although it's not easy to predict exactly what impact these important developments are going to have in practice, particularly given the lack of take up of the current mechanisms for collective redress in the UK. I think we do expect there to be um, a significant increase in the number of such actions brought in the UK immediately following the, um, the introduction of these new rules. Um, however, as Christoph will now explain, the position in Germany is, is somewhat different. Yes, the answer from Germany is fairly easy. We don't have uh, class actions, so uh, cartel damage claims in Germany are uh, individual actions by each possible cartel victim without uh, having a binding effect on other cases. Um, so we don't have what, what Chris just uh, mentioned for the UK and Ben for DC. Um, we don't have any opt-in or opt-out solutions. Um, the model which possibly come closest to an opt-in collective action is uh, what we can call a bundling model so that the claimants can um, bundle their claims and jointly assign them to a, a litigation company. Um, the admissibility of this uh, model has been confirmed by the Federal Court in 2009 in a case involving, I would say, the most prominent um, litigation company uh, which is active in Germany and elsewhere, which is CDC. Uh, you can imagine what this stands for. Um, and uh, they are pretty active in, in Germany um, on, in two cases relating to the German um, cement cartel as well as the um, bleaching agent cartel. Um, we have uh, listed, let's say, other um, solutions which at least have a collective element uh, in them, although these um, do not play a major role in practice. One is the um, contractual solution on, on, on a model suit, so an agreement between the parties that um, the outcome of their case should have a binding effect on comparable cases and scenarios. Um, and the second one, which, which we listed here, are association claims 
uh, of certain um, consumer or industry associations to skim off the revenues of, of the cartelists. However, uh, not to the benefit of their members or the association, but uh, to the uh, benefit of uh, the government. And that's why, as you can imagine, this uh, is not a real financial incentive to take advantage of, of this solution. So to sum up, I, I would say um, Germany is, is, is definitely not the forum for collective actions, and it's fair to assume that um, this will remain to be the case. The German uh, lawmaker is, is traditionally very skeptical about anything which at least come close to uh, class actions, um, and uh, so we will, in a way, remain a blank area in the in the worldwide uh, class action uh, map. And Chris, I understand you want to comment also uh, from from the European level. Um, yes, thanks, Christoph. Um, as, as many people might be aware, uh, one of the general European-wide developments in relation to antitrust damages claims um, is a proposed directive by the proposed by the European Commission on rules governing actions for damages under national law. Um, these are wide-ranging proposals, but we don't propose to discuss them um, today, particularly as there is still a fair amount of uncertainty as to what laws will be introduced and when, and what could be the practical implications of um, those proposals will be. However, it is worth noting that at the same time as um, publishing that draft directive, the Euro European Commission issued what it called a series of common non-binding principles for collective redress mechanisms in member states. And those key recommendations included um, the introduction of collective redress mechanisms to provide for both injunctive and compensatory relief, the introduction of an opt-in system with alternatives, including opt-out, being very much the exception rather than the rule, um, and the introduction of procedural safeguards, very similar to the safeguards introduced in the UK, um, including a bar on contingency fees and punitive damages, um, and allowing only non-profit representing claimants to bring claims. So although member states are asked to put these measures in place by June 2015, um, these recommendations are not binding. Um, and although it's anticipated that a few member states um, will act on these recommendations, um, if implemented by even a handful of member states, um, these recommendations could have a very significant impact on, on collective damages redress in the Euro wider European Union. So I think we've, we've now sort of gone over the, one of the first issues we identified, which was collective redress, and Ben's going to move to the second issue um, we wanted to address today, which is disclosure and discovery, and Ben will take us through the general position in the U.S. Thanks, Chris. Uh, disclosure and discovery in the U.S. in cases, many big cases, not just antitrust, but particularly large antitrust cases, is really broad and intrusive. Um, it involves collecting and producing documents, substantial numbers of documents, both electronic materials and paper documents, uh, although increasingly more on the electronic side these days. Uh, it involves numerous depositions, dozens of depositions. It's not uncommon in large antitrust cases to have over 100 depositions, depending on how many parties are involved. Uh, it involves responding to written requests for information, such as interrogatories and requests for admission. And uh, non-parties, third parties such as uh, customers and suppliers and competitors can be compelled to produce information too. And in antitrust cases, they often are, depending on the issues. And usually that's in the form of documents or deposition testimony or sometimes both. Um, in the US, <clears throat> civil plaintiffs typically have access to the same evidence that's provided to the government in any underlying cartel investigation. It's usually provided by the defendants themselves in response to discovery requests. Uh, and because discovery in large class actions in particular can be so complex and burdensome, there have been ongoing efforts to try to address that burden and limit it. And uh, you know, this is typically driven by the defense side, but it's not exclusively a burden on the defense side. If you have a plaintiff, particularly a large organizational plaintiff, the discovery burden in an antitrust case could be quite large for them as well. Uh, so there are several of these efforts underway. There are currently amendments to the federal rules of civil procedure that govern civil actions. Uh, these are under consideration. They would change the presumptive limits on discovery and make some changes that are attempted to reduce the burden overall. Um, there's also a trend in federal courts, at least, to 
adopting and enforcing the concept of proportionality in discovery. And that means that the discovery burden should be reasonably related to the claims and the uh, amount at issue and the, the importance of the issues uh, in the case and that are subject to discovery. Um, it'll be interesting to see whether that has a major effect on antitrust cases because one might argue that uh, the claims and issues are, are pretty important and the damages tend to be pretty high. Um, so one could argue that, that uh, discovery should be proportionally large there. But in smaller cases, it certainly should have an effect. An interesting note in the U.S. is that these efforts um, are a little bit in tension with the, the other trend that we touched on in the class certification discussion, which is to inquire into the merits of the claim earlier in the case, and certainly before trial. Uh, and so the standards to actually get to trial for plaintiffs have, have arguably been going up and probably are getting a little bit higher. Plaintiffs have to produce evidence of the merits of their claim earlier in the case, usually at the summary judgment stage, but even now perhaps at the class certification stage. And you could argue that that uh, cuts it against putting limits on discovery, or presumptive limits at least. Um, so that's a, a, a little bit of a tension there that will play out, I think, as these federal rule amendments are considered. Uh, now, Chris, how does this broad discovery in the U.S. compare to the position in the U.K.? Um, well, in fact, in the U.K., parties to proceedings are also generally required to provide wide-ranging disclosure of documents um, after the close of pleadings. Um, and although the exact scope for disclosure is a matter for the court in each case, the normal approach is to require the parties to disclose all documents that support their own case or harm their opponent's case, and vice versa. However, that said, there are a range of um, other approaches available to the court, including disclosure on an issue-by-issue -issue basis. But for most cases, the standard approach of wide range of disclosure is adopted. And for these purposes, um, documents include hard copy documents and all form of electronic records, which is becoming increasingly important in these cases. So for example, documents and, um, and data contained on servers, databases, and electronic archives, all fall to be disclosed in UK proceedings. Um, it's also worth noting that um, orders for disclosure may be made against and applied for against third parties, um, which, although there are various cost implications associated with um, such orders. But a key issue in the UK and, and indeed for the rest of Europe um, is whether defendants should be required to disclose as part of a disclosure exercise leniency materials provided to the European Commission or national competition authorities. So the current position under EU law is governed by the Flydera case. And in that case, the European courts held that it was necessary for courts in member states to balance the interests against disclosure, against those for disclosure, in each case. Now, in fact, um, one of the first times this balancing exercise was undertaken was in the High Court in London in relation to the National Grid case. And in that case, um, some limited leniency materials were required to be disclosed although that, was follow, follow, um, that only followed a very detailed document-by-document document review conducted by the court. However, in a very recent case, just a couple of weeks old, a much broader approach was taken, with the High Court taking the view that disclosure should be required of anything that was relevant. However, the general feeling is that such a broad approach is inappropriate and that the judge in that case took the position too far. And it's not clear, indeed, whether this broad-brush approach um, will be maintained going forward. It's also fair to say that um, alleged cartelists have the authorities on their side in this, on this issue. So both the European Commission and the Office of Fair Trading in the UK currently resist um, applications for disclosure of leniency materials to the courts. And that's basically to protect their leniency programs. However, I think we do anticipate that um, as more experience is gained by the courts and regulators and indeed parties, it may be that the authorities will take a, a less resistant approach going forward. And again, this issue is one in which I think we're likely to see some significant developments over the next few years. Um, with that, I'll hand over to Christoph for a view on the position in Germany, um, which I understand is, is very different to the position in the UK and US. Yes, indeed, it's very different. Um, in Germany, we don't have any rules on pretrial uh, discovery or uh, disclosure comparable to those uh, just described by Ben. 
and uh, Chris. Uh, in particular, we don't have a specific, let's say, antitrust law related uh, right to claim for a certain information. We have that in, in certain areas of German law. So, um, for example, in copyright law, we have a right um, to claim for, for the disclosure of information on, um, on illegal copies of IP protected work. Works. However, we don't have a let's say comparable claim in the antitrust area, so no right to claim for information on the functioning of the cartel, on um, the question which uh, customers have been um, targeted, uh, which bits may have been manu manipulated, or uh, the, the the overcharge which has been um, produced by the cartel, um, and this is basically in line with the general rule of, of German law that uh, neither party has to produce any documents or explain the facts. So each party basically is, is responsible to provide evidence to back their arguments. Um, given the lack of any rules on, on discovery disclosure, um, access to uh, the cartel authorities' files is often be regarded to be key for a successful damage claim, as uh, Chris just uh, mentioned. However, looking at, at the cases and looking at the cartel authorities' decision, um, we often notice that the decision itself is often not such a say, valuable source um, for uh, information which you need for, for a successful uh, uh, damage claim. For, for several reasons. Uh, one is obviously that a lot of uh, cases are settled with the Federal Cartel Office in Germany, and then the FCO only needs to um, publish, uh, uh, needs to take a very short uh, decision, just a couple of, of pages long often. But even for, for long decisions, uh, they, they rarely have um, really valuable information on uh, say the level of overcharge um, charged to certain particular customers, uh, plus uh, um, a lot of uh, business secrets are typically redacted. So overall, um, not uh, not too much information from this side. Then again, and uh, Chris, you mentioned the the Flydera case in the I would say in the aftermath of the Flydera case, um, uh, a German court decided that uh, leniency documents in, uh, in Germany are generally protected from disclosure. Um, so here the FCO is, is particularly keen to uh, protect its very successful leniency program um, from too much uh, and too broad um, um, access to, to leniency documents. So uh, in the, as you can imagine, in the run-up of, of uh, cartel damage claims, we see a lot of litigation on this topic, access to files, which can take a long time before the actual damage claim can be initiated. Um, so again, uh, the comment from Germany is that um, it is a fairly restrictive uh, approach, um, and um, we, we still uh, continue to lack of, of uh, really hard, uh, say, typical um, pre-trial discovery rules. Um, ben, I understand you now kick off the last topic, which is damages. That's right. Thanks, Christoph. So uh, in the U.S., I'll just cover a couple things on damages. Um, the goal of private antitrust enforcement in the U.S. is not surprisingly to compensate victims of antitrust violations, but it's also to supplement public enforcement. And a number of Supreme Court cases historically have spoken of uh, private plaintiffs in antitrust actions serving as private attorneys general and really supplementing the public enforcement uh, either where the government uh, doesn't have the resources to step in or, or where it does, but it just can't recover damages the way the private plaintiffs can. Um, and this leads to the concept of treble damages in the U.S. And so, uh, as we've sort of alluded to before, private plaintiffs in the U.S. can recover treble damages, which is three times the actual damages suffered. The one exception is uh, with DO successful DOJ leniency applicants. So uh, private plaintiffs can only recover actual damages from a successful leniency applicant. Um, those applicants, the successful applicants, also are not subject to joint and several liability in the U.S. 
Private plaintiffs can also recover the costs of suit and reasonable attorney's fees. And it's also worth mentioning, it's not on the slide, but uh, in typically an antitrust case in the U.S., a damages case, will be tried to a jury. And so that adds an element, a little bit of an element of uncertainty uh, in the sense that you have to educate a lay jury on what can be complicated economic concepts at times. One big question that comes up, and, and I think we'll hear from my colleagues a bit on this, uh, is whether indirect purchaser plaintiffs um, can sue under the antitrust laws and whether a uh, defendant can assert a defense that the purchaser, usually the direct purchaser, was not harmed because it passed on any possible overcharge. Under federal law in the United States, the answer is fairly simple. Neither indirect purchasers nor the passing on defense are permitted. Uh, it's more complicated under state law in the U.S. So most states in the U.S., I think it's all but one actually, have any state antitrust laws, many of which mirror the federal Sherman Act. And uh, private plaintiffs can bring claims under those state laws. And uh, a number of those states have explicit provisions that permit indirect purchasers to sue. And even in those states that don't, there's an, another substantial number where courts in those states have interpreted their antitrust law to permit indirect purchaser lawsuits. So what you often see are direct purchasers suing under federal antitrust law, state, I'm sorry, indirect purchasers suing under state antitrust law. Oftentimes these claims are consolidated in what we call a multi-district litigation in federal court. Uh, because of jurisdictional issues, many times those state claims can be pulled into federal court. Um, one interesting note, though, is that not all states that permit indirect purchasers to sue also permit the passing on defense. Those two things often go hand in hand, but not always. And California is an example. Uh, the Supreme Court in California has decided that indirect purchasers can sue, but the defendants cannot assert a passing on defense. And the court has just simply acknowledged that that may require uh, divvying up damages among different parties and that that may be complicated, but that that's simply something that courts under California law uh, will have to do and live with. And now I'm going to turn it over to Chris to explain how uh, that situation compares with the UK. Um, thanks, Ben. Um, well, in the UK, the general position is similar to that in that compensatory damages will generally be awarded um, in the UK with a view to putting the claimants in this position that they would have been in if there hadn't been an infringement of competition law. Um, and that includes direct and indirect purchases. Um, by contrast um, to the states, exemplary damages may be claimed but only in limited circumstances in the UK, um, and including when a defendant has deliberately or recklessly infringed competition law, effectively calculating that any damages that they might have to pay um, would outweigh or would be outweighed by potential gains of infringing competition law. Um, so in the UK, the High Court has ruled that exemplary damages are not available in circumstances, for example, where a defendant has already been fined by a competition authority or where the defendant is um, a successful immunity applicant or leniency applicant. Um, and in practice, I think, going forward, um, awards of exemplary damages are likely to be relatively rare in the UK, um, although it's fair to say that the Competition Appeal Tribunal has, in one case, awarded exemplary damages in the context of an abuse of dominance case. Um, Looking again to some of the, the proposals that the government put forward, um, it's notable that the government um, recently consulted on a proposal to introduce a rebuttable presumption of loss in cartel cases in the UK. Um, this proposal has now been dropped, um, but the proposal had been to um, presume an overcharge of 20% in, in all cartel cases. Um, as I said, actually, the government decided to drop this proposal. But that action by the government in dropping the proposal and the fact that most cases um, reach settlement before the trial um, means that actually the bounds um, of what is recoverable in antitrust damages cases in the UK is still very unclear and uncertain. And I think we have a long way to go before um, we reach full clarity on that issue. And again, as Ben mentioned, um, a key and controversial issue in cartel damages cases in the UK is the availability of the passing on defence. Um, the thrust of that defence effectively being that um, if 
that any overcharge was passed on by a claimant to its own customers, then in fact the claimant didn't suffer any loss, um, or at least no recoverable loss. Um, but although that defence um, hasn't been definitively established in, in the UK, um, it's generally accepted that the passing on defence is available to defendants. Um, and this reflects the, the general wider position in the UK that damages should be compensatory. Um, and it also, as Ben mentioned, reflects a policy intent in Europe that um, direct and indirect purchasers should be able to recover damages. But as I said, there's no definitive authority on that issue yet. Um, and a, another issue, though, is that it's not clear where the practical burden of proof will be. The, and the formal burden of proof will, of course, be on defendants to show that there was pass-on. But in practice, it remains uncertain whether defendants um, will have to prove pass-on or whether, in practice, claimants will have to prove the lack of pass-on. Um, and either way, um, what is clear is that if a pass-on defence is pleaded by any defendants in, a, in an antitrust case, um, that will have a significant impact on the scope and depth of any disclosure that they have to give, because they'll have to give disclosure then about all of their on-sales um, in order to prove that there was no pass-on. Um, in fact, I understand that the position um, is, in Germany is very similar um, in many respects to that. So, Christoph, could you take us through the position in Germany? Yes. Um, in 2011, the federal court in Germany has, um, say, answered to two pretty central questions uh, in this context. Uh, one is that not only direct but also uh, indirect purchasers uh, have standing in court and can claim damages from the cartelists. And uh, secondly, um, and as a kind of flip side to allowing the indirect purchasers to join the proceedings um, that the cartelists can rely on the passing on defense, as, as Ben just um, said, and this often goes hand in hand in Germany, uh, even in one federal court decision. And the federal court um, here provided at least some rough uh, guidance as to when the passing on defense is available. So uh, the cartelists, among, among other factors, has to show that uh, the general market structure um, allows for a passing on the, the alleged overcharge to the um, next customer level, um, and in addition, um, that the, um, that the uh, passing on was actually caused by the uh, cartel agreement and by the overcharge, uh, and not by alternative factors. Uh, for example, being uh, special sales efforts of, uh, of the claimants. Um, on damages, the, um, uh, the damage in Germany, this is all about compensation, so uh, the damage is, is the actual uh, sale price, also the difference between the actual sale price of the volumes actually sold uh, and the hypothetical prices and volumes in the absence of the cartel. So um, we don't have any punitive element of triple damages or alike in Germany. Um, the quantum of damage can be uh, estimated by, by a judge. Uh, and here we see, I think, a, uh, increasing, what I said, an increasing sophistication of, of how to approach such, such an estimate. I think it's fair to say that in the old days, um, judges had a certain proclivity for very simple uh, methods. They used to, uh, let's say, um, provide very general findings on uh, the typical overcharge of the cartel. They uh, might use a rule of thumb. But, but nowadays, this becomes more complex. Um, so the parties come up with, uh, with complex economic models. Uh, if you have read the commission's um, paper on, on the quantum of damages um, with uh, reference to simulation models, with regression models, and the like, um, this is all also now subject in, in, in German proceedings um, with a lot of, let's say, um, um, sophistication uh, behind it. As you can imagine, this easily can um, end up in a real battle of expert um, opinions, and this is what happens in German courts. But I think um, this is not a real, uh, this is not really characteristic only for Germany, but this applies to to all jurisdictions. Um, 
And with this, let's say, uh, common ground at the end, uh, uh, I'll hand back for some final, um, let's say, wrapping up and, and final remarks. Um, thanks, Christoph. Well, it, as Christoph mentioned, although we've today explored some of the key differences and indeed similarities between three key jurisdictions um, for antitrust damages cases, to be frank, we've actually barely scratched the surface of the, the issues that parties have to consider. Um, there are a multitude of um, considerations that both defendants and claimants need to think about in relation to these cases, and in relation to which they need to seek joined up advice um, from jurisdictions around the world, and we accept that that's no easy task. Um, so potential claimants and defendants should plan their strategies at a very early stage in order to make sure that they achieve the best possible outcome. And for claimants, that can be as simple as making sure that they choose the legal forum that's right for them um, to, to bring damages claims. For defendants, um, avoiding a particular forum or law is, is very difficult, if not impossible. And in fact, in practice, the choice of forum rests fairly squarely with, with claimants. But as a result, defendants need to start thinking about these issues um, and developing longer-term strategies as soon as an investigation starts. And I think everyone accepts that um, when an investigation begins, parties have enough to think about, but really, and they do need to be thinking about the end game, which is effectively what damages claims will are. And this is especially important to make sure that no steps are taken at an investigatory stage in one jurisdiction, which could have adversely affect or impact the damages stage in another jurisdiction. Um, and so parties need to identify early which jurisdictions they may think may be engaged on the damages cases and to make sure that they don't fall into any bear traps along the, way, along the way. So by way of sort of very final concluding comments, I think everything we've said today um, all comes back to the point that a joined up approach by parties across jurisdictions is essential, and that's in terms of the strategy and the legal advice. Um, and that also applies to both claimants and defendants in these cases. Okay, thank you, Chris. Um, I think that's the, the end of our main session. Um, as a reminder, can I ask everyone to please complete the necessary items for CLE or CPD credit? The CLE forms can be found uh, in the resource list box at the bottom of your screen and should be submitted to clientcle at hoganlovells.com. The CPD survey link is located on the left side of the screen under the media player. The verification code for the CLE program is up on your screen now, 912365. I'll just repeat that, 912365. Also, um, the verification code for um, this SRA program webinar is 071 oblique LWDU. Again, that's on your screen, 071 oblique LWDU. And the number of CPD hours for this program is one hour. Now I think we're going to turn to uh, taking some questions, and I'd like to remind viewers that you can submit your questions by typing into the Q&A box. We have got, a, uh, it looks like, a few questions in. Um, I'm just, the first question uh, is destined for Germany, for Christoph, although I think um, it might be useful to get Ben and Chris's uh, perspective as well. Um, the question is, Christoph, are immunity applicants in any way uh, put in a favorable position in German cartel damage claim proceedings? No, they are not. Uh, they, they are um, jointly and, uh, and several liable for, for the damage suffered by, by the customers as all other um, cartelists. So this is, um, this would say, full um, follow on Civil law liability uh, is obviously you know, a an, an very important factor um, to consider when, um, when going for leniency. Um, and uh, the European legislator addressed this in the um, draft directive. Um, so here we see uh, the proposal that the, uh, li uh, the liability of the immunity um, applicant is limited to uh, the damage um, uh, say suffered by uh, the direct and indirect customers of uh, of the leniency applicant. So, so this is at least a general rule, and Germany would need to adopt it uh, if, if this becomes law. 
Okay, um, thanks, Christoph. And uh, turning to Chris for the UK, how does this compare to the situation here in the UK? Well, it, it's very similar in that, in fact, I suspect um, immunity applicants are disadvantaged um, almost in the UK. So in the UK, it's generally accepted that joint and several liability between cartelists exists and that um, a defendant has the right to claim an indemnity or contribution against all the other um, alleged cartelists. That includes um, immunity applicants. Um, and in fact, in the UK, um, claimants have used this as a device um, to make bringing claims, antitrust damages claims, easier by launching their claim, for example, against only one or two parties and then leaving it to, the, to those parties to then take contribution claims against all the other alleged cartelists. And in fact, this has put um, immunity applicants at a significant disadvantage, um, as they are often the first um, to be targeted by claimants as a result of their guilty plea, and then left with the um, expense and, um, and problems of seeking contribution claims from all of the other um, alleged cartelists. Um, however, as, as Christoph has just mentioned, one of the proposed reforms at the EU level um, is to remove joint and several liability for successful um, immunity applicants. And the driver behind this um, proposal, which was also proposed at a, a UK level, um, was to strike the right balance between um, public enforcement and private enforcement. Um, the importance of public enforcement and the, the um, integrity of leniency regimes has been obviously very important to the European right. Commission um, and the Office of Fair Trading. And as I mentioned, in fact, in the UK, the government was um, thinking of imposing a similar restriction, so um, removing joint and several liability for immunity applicants, um, but decided to wait um, upon the proposals put forward by um, the European Commission. And in fact, if brought into force, as Christoph says, this would mean that immunity applicants would put a very big advantage um, in a favourable position and that they will only be liable for the damages that they themselves have caused and not the conduct of their co-cartelists. Um, although one, I think one important qualifier there is um, um, immunity applicants will still be liable for the whole of the damage if it proves impossible for the claimants to obtain full compensation from, from elsewhere. So, for example, if, if co-cartelists have um, gone in, become insolvent, um, an immunity, immunity applicant may still find that they have to pay the full range of damages. Okay, and um, Ben, uh, how does this compare to the position in the US, um, and uh, particularly in relation to the ability to bring um, contribution claims? Does that exist there? Well, that's a good question, Siong, and there are some interesting differences here with the US. So um, taking that, the second aspect of the question first, as I mentioned, uh, defendants in antitrust private lawsuits are jointly and severally liable. Um, there is not a right of contribution, though, in those cases. And, and this has developed out of U.S. common law relating to torts, and uh, which antitrust claims uh, generally are. And so there is no right of contribution. So not surprisingly, uh, this is a powerful weapon for plaintiffs because plaintiffs can go after any defendant with one exception that is the rest of the answer um, and seek the as much of the damages if not all of it as they want from that one defendant and the defendant does not have a right of contribution um, from the others in some circumstances uh, defendants will enter into judgment sharing agreements and that generally has been upheld but it hasn't been tested much in the courts um, but as to uh, leniency or immunity applicants, if they're successful, um, they are not jointly and severally liable, so, and they are not subject to trouble damages, so they do have those advantages. So it's actually a fairly significant advantage for a successful leniency applicant. Now, they do have the requirement that they have to cooperate with private plaintiffs, so their uh, cooperation extends beyond just the investigation. And that usually involves producing documents voluntarily to private plaintiffs, um, sometimes providing testimony. There's no real one uh, format for how that cooperation takes place, but the judge in the private action is ultimately uh, responsible for determining if the leniency applicant has cooperated such that they receive the benefit of not being jointly and severally liable and not being subject to treble damages. So it's a, some interesting differences with 
the UK and Germany, um, but certainly it is it has affected how antitrust damages claims play out. Okay, thank you, Ben. Um, just uh, turning to another question. Um, actually, again, um, is you, I think it's directed to you, Ben, in the sense that it's can uh, the question is can civil follow-on actions in the United States proceed at the same time as government investigations? They can. Uh, the, the answer is broadly they can. There's no uh, structural or rules restriction on civil actions proceeding at the same time as governmental investigations. Um, usually in cartel cases, the governmental investigation is a criminal investigation and usually by the Department of Justice. The FTC obviously enforces the antitrust laws as well, but not in the criminal context. Um, it, in most cases, the follow-on lawsuits are filed whenever a Department of Justice investigation becomes public or shortly thereafter. That's the, the, the general rule. Um, it is possible, certainly, for private litigation to proceed without a government investigation at all. Um, but that would be, I suppose, not really follow-on litigation. Uh, the one twist, I suppose, is that there are instances where the Department of Justice is pursuing a criminal investigation, and uh, in the U.S. this is typically before a grand jury, and uh, follow-on lawsuits will be filed. The Department of Justice sometimes requests a stay of discovery in those private actions so that it can complete or at least move forward with its investigation. The theory being that discovery in the private actions, which is surely going to overlap with the, uh, the governmental investigations, may be really intrusive to what the Department of Justice is doing. And so their view is they take precedence here, and they've been fairly successful uh, when they have sought a stay of discovery. There was one very recent example in the auto parts uh, investigation and follow-on litigation that is pending in the U.S., and there are also investigations worldwide. The Department of Justice went in just about a month ago to the federal court in Michigan and requested a stay of discovery, even though the plaintiffs wanted to move forward. And the court agreed with the Department of Justice and stayed, I think it was for about six months, but gave them sort of a reasonable time while the cases are still pending to finish their investigation. Okay, thank you, Ben. Um, I think we may have... Uh, an opportunity for very briefly for a th another question. Um, the question, I think, is for the UK, for Chris, uh, which is, is there scope for uh, collective settlement in the UK, given what you have already said? Um, well, in fact, it's quite a timely question in that um, one of the proposed reforms is um, to provide for collective um, settlements in the UK. Again, the details are, haven't been yet published, but and the uh, Competition Appeal Tribunal is expected to have a very big role um, in approving those settlements. And in fact, the current proposal is that um, if the Competition Appeal Tribunal um, approves an opt-out, sorry, an opt-in settlement, um, that will be binding on all of the parties yeah. in the described class, unless, for example, the parties already decided to, to opt-out. Um, and the tribunal will be able to make those collective settlement orders at any time during the proceedings. So, in, in fact, even before um, a collective redress action has been brought, the CAC mm. will have a role in approving um, a collective settlement. And as I say, although the detailed rules have, have yet to be ironed out, um, and I think an interesting issue in terms of the government's um, concern that these cases don't get out of hand, is that the government has stated that the approval process must consider the reasonableness of, of any legal costs incurred um, as part of the settlement. Um, and also to provide um, an opportunity for any members of the class to opt out of the, of the settlement. Thank you, Chris. I think we have come to the end of our, our question time, so if I could just wrap up. Um, this now concludes our webcast. Um, we'd like to thank everyone uh, for your participation, uh, the speakers, but also our a very important audience. Uh, we hope this program has uh, been informative and has addressed some of your questions. Uh, regarding the latest developments in the U.S. and the EU on the cartel damages uh, front. Um, we'll be sending out a link to the webcast and further information on this topic. Can I just say, please stay tuned uh, for further news on our upcoming um, webinar uh, casts for 
2014 will be uh, um, with you. Uh, those will be with you in the new year. And uh, talking about the new year, may I wish everybody happy holidays, given uh, we're in mid-December. And thank you very much again for joining us today.